Good morning. <laughs> I never knew I was on. I keep forgetting. Welcome, every one of you, name by name, person by person. I'm Carlton Pearson, and very happy to be uh, in Houston this morning, one of many, many trips. My first trips were here. I used to preach for John Osteen back in the day, <laughs> Joel's father, long before Joel ever felt any inclination toward preaching. We never expected him to be doing what he's doing today. I'm fourth generation classical Pentecostal preacher. My paternal grandfather and my maternal great grandfather were all preachers. We built churches. And um, I was the associate evangelist for the Oral Roberts Association, one of the great healing thrust in names in, in the 20th century. So, in effect, I have no, no business being here today. <laughs> Somehow, I ended up with all you Unitarian people that I thought was certainly going straight to hell. <laughs> I'm approaching my 70th birthday, and my whole world has shifted in a very pronounced and exciting way. I've never been more curious, never been more interested, never been more adventurous, a little risky, sometimes uh, reckless. Uh, they call me Bishop Carlton Pearson. Many call me now son of Bishop uh, Carlton Pearson. <laughs> and I, I'm working through all of that. It feels good. A little sense of rebellion is there. And um, I've been infected and effected by religion. Some ways defected. And I'm rethinking everything after all these years. My, my major in college was Biblical Literature, English Bible. My minor was Theology, Historical Studies. One of the comments that is one of my favorite quotes is from Voltaire, who says, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. If you do the research on religion in general, particularly the Christian faith, we have been a very atrocious cult for many, many years. Cult is the root word for culture, so I don't mean to sound negative, though there's a lot of negativities in that ideology or the idea of us being a cult. I'm a cult follower of Jesus, as were my parents and their parents and their parents. And um, it served me well for the first 50 years of my life. And uh, when I began to rethink, it wasn't the heaven part, it was the hell part. Pew jumping, devil thumping, Bible quoting, and toting Pentecostal. I mean, we, it was heaven or hell. And uh, I had so many friends going to hell, and those who were on their way to heaven weren't sure they'd get there. Uh, the word inclusion comes from the word enclosure. It means to be safe inside a ring where everybody is okay. My religion and most religions tend to be exclusionary. If you don't believe what we believe the way we believe it, you don't fit in our group. And religion has divided the planet. Christianity is about a third of the population, two million, a little more than that maybe. Muslims have about that same amount, Hindus throughout the world. Uh, so we're not, quote unquote, winning the world for Christ, but that was my objective as a Christian and as an evangelist and one who bared the good news. I have a lot of amazing stories to tell, stood before huge audiences across the planet, millions by way of television and media, uh, and I wondered, and Billy Graham said this to me at the Oklahoma bombing in the, about 23 years ago. Uh, they had this massive, their more building, you may remember the story, exploded. He was the chief eulogist, and I was asked by the governor, then I was a Republican, a very conservative, pro-life guy, and I'm still very, very much pro-life, but I'm just as much pro-choice, and I believe you can be both. And, um, but I was invited in, and he said to me at breakfast that morning, and I'll never forget it, he said, you know, son, I've been preaching the gospel for over 50 years. And it seems to me that the world is worse than it was when I started. He was shaking with Parkinson's disease. I remember how creased and wrinkled his face looked, tanned. Nice little rents on his hair so you couldn't see all of the gray. His wife was sitting right beside him and suffering with osteoporosis, which he brought out in the conversation. She was in great pain. And Franklin, the son, was standing near I was sitting right next to her, and we had this conversation. He plunged right in, and he began to lament to me that he felt or he questioned the efficacy of his ministry. Now, this is Billy Graham, the Pope of Protestantism. I was working for Oral, the Pope of Pentecost. <laughs> and these are my two giant heroes and mentors and sometimes tormentors. 
I, I loved them dearly, revered them, and to this day I still do. But I remember that he was very frustrated. He said, this is an Oklahoma city, not New York or L.A. I've been around the planet. I've preached to multi-millions of people. And I'm beginning to question how effective my ministry was. It made me think of Solomon, who was around 70 when he died, but he, his, he, was a, he built palaces and he was a horticulturist and a botanist and one of the great wise men of scripture. But his final words were vanity. Vanity. All is vanity. That's the saddest scripture in the Bible to me. Meaningless. Meaningless. All is meaningless. How can you achieve what he achieved and end your life saying, this ain't crap? I could have used other language, but I don't use that language in church. I'm, I'm approaching the 70th birthday, and I have preached and prayed and fasted and sought God, studied scriptures, written probably 30, 40 books, and I'm rethinking all of it. This is the 21st century. It's very different than the 20th century in which I was born. I was born halfway through the last century, 1953. I'm 22 years into the new century. And I'm figuring out what's going on. What does all of this mean? I can't tell you how many times I've been in church. I'm a little bored with it, but I'm still here. Y'all pay fairly well. But this is my life. My dad preached, his dad preached. We built physical church structures. But I wrestled all my life with hell. My father's mother and father were Pentecostal preachers and my grandfather was a womanizer and quote unquote backslid. Then my grandmother, whom I adored, also backslid and they were very well known in the city of San Diego where we were reared. So there was a lot of shame, sham, guilt, embarrassment. And when my grandmother died, my dad told me this story. My grandmother died after she, quote unquote, came back to the Lord in my freshman year of college. And, uh, but she had a gambling uh, habit and she played the dogs in Tijuana just across the border from San Diego. And uh, she just quietly gambled. It exacerbated her, stressed her to the point, I think, that she had a massive heart attack and died the next day. The guilt was too much for her. Plus she felt God was not pleased with her life and daddy went to the emergency room. He was the first of the seven children, her first child. He was there, and he could hear them trying to resuscitate her three unsuccessful times. The third time, the room got quiet, he says, and the doctors took off their gloves and mask, and they all walked quietly out of the room, and daddy was standing there in emergency, uh, uh, and he went quietly and by himself, and there his mother laying on the gurney with her arms hanging off the side, her breast exposed, her mouth open, her eyes partially opened, and uh, she looked like she was in the place she taught him gambler's go. Daddy pushed her mouth closed, closed up her little gown, folded her hands on her lap so that his sisters who were coming wouldn't see their mother looking like that. But daddy carried that expression for almost 40 years. Of his mother, not just dead, but weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth infinitely. My father would not only die for my mother, or kill for my mother, he would have died for his mother. He loved her. She was the eldest of, his, of the seven children. He outlived all of them. The baby boy, my uncle James, died the month before my dad, which is my 62nd birthday in March, eight years ago. So Danny had all this. His back was, he had ulcers, back was twisted. The chiropractor said, you, know, you have no idea how much pain your dad has been through. And I began to think of the pain, the pathos, um, the pathology of the pain that so many people that I grew up with and loved dearly suffered. And that we were constantly aware of hell. I remember sitting with my dad was about almost a little less than 10 years before he died. I opened the scriptures after I'd had my revelation of the gospel of inclusion and that in the finished work of the cross, as an Adam, all die, all humans die, so in Christ, all will be ultimately made alive. So all is all. So if people automatically die because of the first man or Adam, 
Why do we have to go through all these hoops to live with the second Adam? Now, that's Christian theology. I don't even believe any longer in a God that demands blood sacrifices with terrible anger management problems. <laughs> we were afraid of the wrath of God. We were afraid of God. I was brought up in fear and faith. I couldn't always tell the difference between the two. To believe in God is to fear God. You'll never fully trust or love somebody you're terrorized by. It's like an abusive God or abusive father, and you run to your mother. I asked my fundamentalist friends, do we need Jesus to protect us from God? Did Jesus come to protect us from God or reconnect us to God in consciousness? Are we saved from God by God? A lot of that is absurd, but it was our faith. And so for me to say this, it's still hard for me to fix my mouth to say some of these words, but I can't help from saying them, and as we minister, as we moved into the 22nd um, century uh, in, the, in this uh, second millennium, I think that, that the church has lost its way and is increasingly losing its relevance. The evangelical fundamentalist church that I served for 40 years has picked a fight with the 21st century. It doesn't want change. It's resisting and resenting change. That's what MAGA means to me. It's not make America great again. It means make America hate again legally so you can get by with lynchings and picnics, pick a nigger and hang them. In the South, people actually would leave church like this on Sunday morning and bring fried chicken and sandwiches and go outside the church, find some Negro to hang, and it would be a sport for white Southern evangelical Christians, I don't know where the consciousness was because I've walked with some of the sweetest, kindest, most generous, loving non-black Christians, as well as, of course, other ethnicities, but that people could be that cruel and that insensitive to watch a little black girl walk by herself with her little pigtails and parents, mothers screaming at her about integrating a school and having to be taken there by guarded by guards I watched that so many times I it never made sense to me it still doesn't and for years and years I carried that but when you believe in a God who will torture people infinitely if hell was remedial or corrective or purgative if there was some resolution that would make sense but to just put people in a customized torture chamber and leave them there infinitely is obscene. The word hell never flowed from the mouth of Jesus. He used the word, Hebrew word, Gehenna, gay meaning gully or gorge or valley of Hinnom. Sheol just meant the grave or death. We, we've come up with this fear-based theology that has millions of people on this planet in all religions, but I'm speaking particularly of the jail, Christian faith now, that are psychotic. We're out of touch with ex ex external reality. There's a lot of mental illness. In fact, you did you know that psychologists say that one out of five people you meet on the street are mentally ill? Take a minute and count down the road. That fifth person. <laughs> that fifth one is crazy. And if they, if they count back, you're going to be the fifth person. And you crazy too. <laughs> I admit, I'm crazy. I mean, a lot of the stuff I believe, I, we believe in haunts and haints and ghosts and holy and unholy, angels and demons and vexations, and I've cast demons out and they were frothing and spitting and cursing, and that was part of my grandfather, great-grandfather was known for that. So Pentecostalism is the exotic form of Protestant Christianity, Protestant Christianity. Martin Luther and the protesting, I'm protesting too, a lot of my beliefs. My 92-year-old mother lives in the house with me, and uh, she, she's, she's a fundamentalist Christian. She struggled more with the gospel of inclusion than my father did, and as he aged, he began to get back into the old way of thinking and the second coming of Christ and this whole idea of Christ coming back, and we've been waiting now 2,000 years, and, you know, every, wars and rumors of wars, and we've gone through all this, this whole idea of God coming back, and most of the Christians I know are afraid of Jesus coming back because he's coming back for a church without a spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. Now, I know you Unitarians don't even read the Bible that much, but that's one of the scriptures in there. 
The reason you're not as scared is, is, is you don't read the scriptures as much and study them. If you read them and study, they'll scare the hell out of you. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I've wrestled with this whole idea. My brother, um, I have one brother. He never bought into it. I always did. I was very committed. One of my travels, with, I traveled with Old Roberts. I saw his anguish. His daughter was killed in a plane crash with her husband. His son went to the All Souls Church in Tulsa was gay, had spoke, I think, seven languages, had three PhDs, and we expected him to succeed his father as president of the university, but he was saying gender loving, and of course that would not flow with, with our tradition. And uh, he ultimately, and he was sharp and charming. We didn't know he was gay, handsome, tall, married with children, and a brilliant young man. And I remember that when I heard that he had committed suicide. I used to hate the All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa because that's where this kid went to church and I thought if they really had the Holy Ghost like us, they would have got him delivered from his homosexuality and he wouldn't have committed suicide. That was, that was the min mindset for years. Now I'm a member of that church. I, I tried to cast the devil out of it and I got cast into it and <laughs> I'm on the pastoral staff of that church. But see, we had taught that he was demon possessed. He wasn't, he wasn't demon possessed, but that's the way we were taught, or that he was mentally ill. We made him sick with our religious judgmentalism. He was charming and sharp and smart, and he had a lot going for him, but he never felt accepted by his parents. And they grieved to the day they died. I spent three and a half hours with Old Roberts, and I was able to convince him, I think, that his son wasn't in hell. Can you imagine? My dad sat in a funeral with his mother, in a coffin, the place was packed, and we're all singing and humming, be not dismayed, whatever be tight, God will take care of you. And he knew his mother was in hell. The same God who saved her soul was now going to condemn her to hell. Just think of the psychological erosion on millions of people who believe that God loves them and hates them. How can God's mercy endure forever and hell endure forever? One would cancel out the other. We have absurd, absurd thinking. Christianity and other religions, of course, have committed the most horrific crimes against humanity. If you do the whole, the whole of the Dark Ages, and if you study the Inquisitions, and do you know many people don't know that King James, and I think evangelicals have gotten King James and King Jesus mixed up. <laughs> Both of them's mother's name was Mary. One was Mary, Queen of Scots. The other was Mary, supposedly the Virgin. Well, he wrote in the 16th century, go ye, his translators translated the scripture, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In English, creatures have never been human. There are animals or critters, monsters even. So they use that scripture, that's 1611, 1618, 19, the first slaves officially arrived here. Enslave them, then save them. Slavery is based in scripture. Somebody's interpretation of scripture. So they, and I had a, a, a white gentleman, very well-meaning, Christian, Holy Ghost Phil, 50 years ago when I first got to Tulsa. He said, you know, I hate to say this, Carlton, but just think about it. As horrible as slavery is and was, if it had not been for slavery, you and your people would still be in Africa worshiping heathens and demons and on your way to hell. So you should be thankful for slavery. And when he got up, <laughs> because I clapped him. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> being man born of color all my life and, and, and the impoverishment of it, and most of our pastors, the two, two of my pastors, couldn't even read well. They were janitors. We were reading, doing the, doctor, you know what you're doing, because you, you, you can read music, you probably write it, you have an incredible voice. But the people I grew up with, we didn't have handles because most of the folk couldn't read. And you certainly couldn't read music. So we sang by rote. Our songs were a little bit more lively than yours, but they <laughs> almost snatched them hymnals and throw them out the window so you can do like that. You know? 
we had that bump and that, that was pain. We had a lot of pain. And, and the, the worship services where there was a lot of pain and pathos and agony and the, somebody would scream out because there was so much pain in our culture, in our consciousness, and we're all suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic distress disorder, stress disorder. That starts when you move down the birthing canal, come out of your mother's womb after floating in water for nine months. You're 80% water when you come out. Your brain and lungs remain 80% water. As adults, we're about 50 to 60% water. The Earth's surface is 70% water. We're moisture. We're water. That's why names and how you're called causes vibrations and chemical responses in your body. There's a lot that's happening all the time. And evolution doesn't happen without dissolution. What we're seeing is the old crumbling in front of us. There's an element in our country, and there are millions of them, but their numbers are smaller than those who are progressives. The majority is not ruling like it should. The electoral college has stopped that. Hillary Clinton won by three million more of the popular vote. Biden, seven million more. But the majority doesn't rule anymore. Americans are, in general, progressive, smart people. There's an element that wants to hold on to control, and they're freaking out because they're losing control. That's what January 6th. We just celebrated the, the 100th year anniversary of the Oklahoma massacre, the Black Wall Street, last summer. I didn't know about it. My parents and grandparents, not my parents, but my great-grandparents and my mom came from Oklahoma. I knew preachers and leaders. We were so wounded by that, they would say, hush, boy, shh, leave it alone. You don't know what you're talking about. Don't mention it. Many black slave males were, were uh, brutalized and raped by wealthy landowners, plus wealthy landowners from the Benin tribe in Africa sold slaves, Africans. That's the first black-on-black -black crime. That happened in Africa. We were sold by the millions because of tribal infractions. Again, exclusionism. Inclusion pulls us all together. When I look at you, I'm looking at a version of me. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a version of me. You're a bit contorted, but you're a version of me. <laughs> I see, I see universalism, uni, uno, one verse, version, or versification of the whole. We are all inextricably connected, inseparably connected. And having a conversation, especially with somebody you don't know or have never met before, you will reveal that you are touching on the same base. We want love. We want security. We all have hurts and hearts and hopes. We all want family and want our families to be all right. And, and a lot, most churches have a sign outside that says all welcomed. But that doesn't mean all wanted. Just because you're welcome, that doesn't mean you want it. You've experienced that with family reunions. <laughs> er, everybody welcome, but everybody ain't wanted. So sorting through this whole, this, this whole idea is that we're the chosen group and if I'm chosen, that means, and I'm, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a chosen person, then the rest of you are not chosen. And so I've discussed it with many of my rabbinical friends, Jewish friends, and uh, we've had, they are too rethinking all of this. Who's selected above somebody else? I often say, well, as long as there are races, there's going to be racisms. Well, not all racism is evil, of course. I, I, I'm prejudiced about stuff. You know, I admit, to be integrous, or to have integrity means to integrate all that you are. The bold, the shy, the bashful, the proud, the arrogant, the ignorant, the happy, the sad. We're all there. I don't believe in personality disorders. I just believe in personalities out of order. <laughs> There's a time to be a little bit more suspicious and a little bit more careful with carrying. There's a time to be a little frightened or, or, or concerned. There's a time to be totally bold and fearless. Those, those moods in their place work. I'm, ex I'm accepting the fact that I'm a human being being human, and I'm finally celebrating that. It's not, it's, it's not a sin for a human being to be human. Stop apologizing for your humanness. You know how I want to be remembered? Not as Bishop Carlton Pearson or evangelist or pastor or prophet or anything. I want to be remembered as a sacred humanist because that's what I think Jesus was. 
I don't think he wants to be worshipped the way people worship him. He never suggested that. We can't actually, to be honest with you, prove that he ever existed except in the scriptures. The Roman annals don't ever mention him. Neither do they mention Pilate or Caiaphas or any of the things we hear in the scripture. But the concept of Jesus is cool with me. You know, if I found out that he never existed, I'm still cool. Because it was 2,000 years ago, it ain't, that don't mean that much. You know, I'm, I'm living today, okay? So if his daddy was a carpenter, mine did a little carpentry too. <laughs> uh, I'm not freaked out. Even if they, wasn't, they found out he wasn't resurrected, or they, some people think he got married and moved to, to Turkey. I'm cool with that, of him having kids. Can you imagine the lady, the, the, um, wit, uh, the, um, they, they said she was a prostitute, and she took uh, a year's worth of wages to buy this perfume, and she anointed his body. He's laying, reclining on the floor from, from head to toe. She's putting oil and crying and using her long hair. That's pretty sensual. It, it, kind of interesting, if you want to know the truth. Uh, he's touching, she's touching his body. Now, he's a man, so if he didn't get at least interested, he was gay. Or maybe bi. But if he's a human, in either way, he had some inclination toward pleasure. He got hungry. He got angry. He had to take a leak every once in a while. He hung around with a bunch of rough dudes like, like, because shepherds were the equivalent of professionally of truck drivers today. These men left their wives and children and for two and a half years traveled with him all over about 25 miles from where he was born. Sure, they would have a beer together and laugh, shower or bathe in the Gal Galilee, in the, in, the, in the river. Humanizing for a minute. Can you relate to him as a human? I like to ask this question everywhere I go. What's working for you in your life? And what's not working for you? And if you were to make a list of the two, which, which would be the longest? And then what's working as you? How do you, how do you show up in the world? In your marriages, in your relationships, on the job? What happens when you enter a room? What happens when you exit one? Because we all carry energy. And we vibrate and we create atmospheres and change them. What's working on you? What keeps you awake at night? What's the itch that you have difficulty scratching? And how do you perceive that which works against you? That's based on what you believe about you, why you believe that about you, and how those beliefs about you add to or subtract from the quality of your life. When I lost the church, the property, the prestige, and became a card-carrying heretic, my self-worth was connected to the pulpit and your responses to me. And I remember whining and complaining and lamenting one day, and I said, God, nobody loves me anymore. To go from hero to zero, it seemed like seconds. It was about a year or two. But um, I remember thinking, oh, these, nobody likes me anymore. Nobody loves me. And I, I remember hearing a voice say inside of me, do you love you? Do you know I had never even thought about that? My love for me was based on how you received me. I couldn't even answer the question. It's not important that I love me, I thought. It's only important that they love me and you love me based on their love for me. I had to reevaluate everything. I not only love me for the first time in my life, I actually like me. Thank you. <laughs> and it's not based on that applause. I had to, because when the applause stopped, there was nobody there but me. You have to reconsider yourself. I never heard a sermon in my life about God loving, liking me, only that God loved me, and I had to believe that God loved me, because if I didn't believe God loved me, God would send me to hell. Just for not believing that God loved me. Can you believe that? It's like, God loves you. If you were the only person on the planet, Jesus died for you and your sins. Do you believe this? No, get out of my face, dude. I'm not into religion. Oh, you don't believe that Jesus loves you? No, I don't. I want you to get the hell out of my face. 
oh, get that. Well, you're going to hell. Go straight to hell. He just got through saying, Jesus loves you and died for your sins. But if you don't believe that, to hell with you. That's my religion. I didn't realize that. Wrap your arms around yourself. I always want you to, to identify your humanness when you do that. That you count. Your, your fears and your faith. Your weaknesses and your strengths. Your humanness. Your beingness is part of who you are. No longer be defined by your religion or confined to it. Be free to be you. To not only love you, but like you. That's a task. I surrender you to it. I welcome you. One since I commission you to get to know you better and to like you. You already love you, that's automatic. Liking takes work. Thank you, God, that you do with all things well. Whoever and however you express yourself in the universe, we look up because we don't know where else to look. Thank you that you are father and mother to us and that somehow in the intelligence of spirit, Holy Spirit, you bring clarity and verity and certainty to who we are. And we say yes to that in your name. And so it is. Amen. Bye. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Have a breath, man. Thank you very much. <laughs>